couldn't tell. Did anybody enjoy worship this morning? Yeah. I did okay. I want to, I want to do something with you uh, this morning. Um, <clears throat> I, I had this idea, and uh, I thought, well, Lord, just, you know, as, as always, you'll confirm for me that this is what we're supposed to do, talk about, and... Uh, a, a wonderful woman who's in here today just called me and said, hey, my husband and I are reading through the Bible, and, you know, we, we really want to get, we really want to get deeper. We want to get closer to the Lord. We want to get, get more out of reading. And I was like, that's, I'm writing those notes. I literally pinned these words down uh, before you called. And so if that is you, and I hope it is, uh, because that, that is my greatest want for you. Um, if, it, if it becomes illegal for us to meet in this way, the church should thrive because you have the Scripture, and, and you can scour that, and you can hear uh, from God because uh, the Holy Spirit will teach you. And if we don't have a supernatural God that can teach you and lift you up and encourage you, then what are we doing here anyways? I, I, could, I could have had more sleep this morning, right? So, um, anyways, I, I just want to throw this out. So, this is what I'm looking at today. I have, uh, I have a box of dirt, and many of you are like, wow, that is symbolic of our pastor. No, that's, that's not what we're doing today, and I resent that. Um, this is sort of like your scripture. Anytime you open your Bible, and I couldn't bring my Bible in because I had such a handful of stuff uh, I, I have all of my scripture printed out for me, um, but every time you open your Bible, you kind of have like this, and this analogy breaks down, but, but you have this, this soil, right, and, and you're going across and, and, and you're, you're mining for treasures. Let's say we're looking for gold, just, just to do a real simplistic analogy. Okay, we're looking for gold. So when you open your scripture, you want to find. Hopefully, your intent is God. Show me something about yourself. That will be gold for you. That will be treasure for you. Maybe though you're in a desperate time and you say, God, I need something to comfort me, to help me. I need wisdom. That would be gold for you. And it is all there. But hopefully, this will be relatable. Sometimes it's easier to get on YouTube and look at somebody else mining gold than to do it myself. And I don't mean that in a tacky way at all. And, and I, I don't, I'm not saying that you can't take in teaching. Man, I take in teaching. I read books. I do all of those things. But it is all second to hearing directly from the Creator, from Him speaking to me, from the Holy Spirit, giving a revelation straight into your heart. And so I want to work with you on how to do that. And we're going to just stay right on course. We've been walking through the Gospels. After Christmas, we just stayed right on course. And today we're in John chapter 2. I'm going to read John chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. So we're going to read this, this passage. Very interesting. Hang with me. And we're going to look for gold. Now, we're going to find gold in two places, and the first place we're going to find it is right on top of the ground, okay? So as you study and as you know the word more, you will find that you can get more gold out of a passage, but if, uh, if you open your Bible for the very first time, there is gold there for you. We're going we're gonna to mine this together today, okay? And so hopefully you can take this into your own habits, in your own study, and begin to get gold out of the Scripture for yourself. Sound good? All right. John chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, all the Scriptures on the screen, okay? We're in the New Testament. This is where Jesus shows up. He is what we believe was the waited for coming Messiah, spoken all about in the first 39 books of the Bible, the Old Testament. And so the, the New Testament is 27 books, and it starts when Jesus arrives on the scene, okay? So we have John here who is an eyewitness, giving an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus, and he was with him from the beginning. This is going to be a sign that Jesus performs, and this will be his first one. This is the first sign. Many will say Jesus' first miracle. I would debate that. This is his first sign. 
and it means something very powerful. Let's go. John chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. That's a big stone water jar. Fill the, water, fill, fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine one first, then after people are drunk, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum together with his mother, his brother, and disciples, and they stayed there only a few days. Now, there's one passage right there, okay? That's it. I could, I could pull up a child and say, show me some gold on the ground. Give me something that you get out of the, I, I, I didn't ask you, what does this mean to you? That's, <laughs> okay, no. What is here? What is he saying? What is the surface meaning? What is the literal meaning? So I, I can find quite a few things in here. One, and this may just be personal to me, but as I look at this Scripture, you guys can see in the camera, just, just dirt, just dirt. I see, I see something right off the top. Now, it may not be the thing that you saw off the top. And you may read this 10 years from now, and you may find a new coin just right on the top that you never saw. And that's how the Scripture works. You'll read something 100 times, and you'll get more gold out of it every time. It is rich in gold. There's not a single wasted word in here. And so, here's one for me. Well, why can't I turn water into wine? And I see miraculous deeds that are done in the Bible, and I think, why, why hasn't that ever happened to me? This one is interesting because as you read, you'll notice that Jesus never turns water into wine again that we know of. It's not particularly useful to the church. In fact, I think if you did it too much, <laughs> it could be a little destructive to the church. It's interesting. But regardless, why don't I see stuff like this more often? Let me propose this for just a moment. This is just speaking to you as a pastor. If Jesus would have turned water into wine more than once, we would have complete denominations that say you're going to hell unless you can first turn water into wine. I worship Jesus who turned water into wine, which makes no sense is illogical unless you somehow believe in the supernatural. But I worship the God who did it, not what he did. And so we take a lot of the miracles, signs and wonders, out of the Bible and begin to worship the signs and wonders. But that's not the treasure. Right? So which would you rather have? Would you rather have the coin? Oh, good catch. You see her? I want none of that preacher's money. Would you rather have the coin or the giver of the coins? And so, as we see these things, it had to mean 
something. There's a greater meaning behind it. Jesus didn't just walk around going, zap, zap, zap. That's why I'm not up here with a sport coat going, oh, you're all healed. It doesn't mean anything. Do you understand that miracles do not make people necessarily believe? The miracles in the Bible will validate, let me start over, the signs in the Bible will validate, validate Jesus' claims to be who he said he was, but not everyone in the Bible was healed. Right? And so we, we, yes, I serve a God who can do it, but I also serve the God who created it. Let me, let me say it this way. I'm going to die someday. No matter how much you pray for me, because the world was set in motion so that mortality would push me to trust in God sooner than later. If every prayer were answered, no one would ever die. There would be 30 billion people on the earth, and we would never fear death, therefore we would just always be just about to get around to following Jesus. Because it's not convenient now, and there's no urgency to ever get there. Does that make sense? And you're like, I did not see that coin. You will. You'll see it. You'll see, you'll see coins that I don't see. That's why we have to study together. Now, there's another just blaringly blatant coin that is staring at me just right off. I didn't have to dig a bit. I mean, look through, look through this soil. There's something just incredible that is here. I can, pull, I can pull a lot of gold right off the top, but none more important than this one. Jewish, Jewish purification. Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that if you're walking into a wedding and there's a water jar there for you to purify yourself, what are you doing? You're cleaning yourself. So they had a ritual purification that they would do. And so most of the time there would be some sort of utensil and they would take the utensil and dip water and then they would, you know, do their hands. Some say that they would actually put their hands into the water. But this was water that was used for cleaning. This is water that you would not drink. Okay? This is not something where you walk up to the ladle and... Okay? Because let me just explain this to you, Americans. People didn't show up having never been to the bathroom before. They've all had to go, probably that day. Much healthier diet than us, probably a couple times that day. And there is no toilet paper. Mmm. Do I have something in my teeth? Are you, are you following me here? You would never drink this water. It would be disgusting to you. This sounds really bad, but unless in here you are a Jew, you were also disgusting to these people. You were unclean. You were unfit. And you don't get it, and I don't either. But if you have any friends who really prescribe to Judaism, you can offer a BLT as much as you want, and you might as well say I'm barbecue and toilet bowl seats. They're not coming. They're not eating it. It is nasty to them. And then Jesus, for his first sign... One of his, if not the first public miracle, is going to take water that is unfit to drink, and he is going to turn it into a fine wine. Why do you think 
this would be his first public miracle and the first of his signs to proclaim that he is the Messiah. Because Jesus is going to tell us, I have come to make all things new. And he was foreshadowing what he was about to do in taking something unclean and making it not only acceptable, but better than anything that you've had before. Can you follow me so far? So a basic tenet, a principal teaching of Christianity is that you can never be too disgusting, too unclean for Jesus to take you and turn you into something better than what you have ever known before. The water was unclean, and now it has been turned into wine. So if I'm doing a study, I'll, I'll maybe do a quick study on wine. at the, See where wine comes in the Bible. Wine is to make people cheer up, do all those things. It says that it is for the, uh, for the happiness of, of gods and men in places is what it says. But this is to cheer somebody. This is to be something acceptable. It was a gift to man, okay? Like most gifts, we pervert them, okay? Give your son a new video game for Christmas. It can become a hindrance if not checked, right? So we set parameters. God gave you a gift. He set parameters. But that is what the, that's, what, that's what the why means. It's a gift. And so just right off the top, Anyone can see this. You are not unfit. You are not unworthy. You are not disgusting. You are not unusable. Your value, listen to this part, has nothing to do with how good you are. Nothing. In fact, some of your stories are pretty cool because the dirtier the water, the more miraculous the sweet wine. You know what I'm saying? That's why I want you to hear this. That's why the testimony of an addict is powerful. That is some dirty water. The problem comes when we don't think we were that dirty. I don't care if you just filled those stone jars. Those are purification jars. I'm not drinking it no matter what. So despite the color, despite the parts per million in the jar, it is not drinkable. So I need Christ to come and make me something new. This is right here in the passage. Any of you could get this. Any, anybody, we could bring up a child and we could get this. The problem is, man, we just, we just breeze through this. And so I understand if it's your first time to read through the gospel, which for almost, listen, for almost everyone in here, if you read through this book entirely, for almost everyone in here, it will be your first time. And I understand that. That's okay. This gold is right on top of the ground and you can get that. Let me, let me, let me help you with this. If if you know that there's gold in this soil, you'll go through it more slowly. You know what I'm saying? You won't leave it until you get the gold out because you know it's there. And so every passage that you have in your Bible, if you will go, there's gold here, you'll get it. Now, Christ came to make us something new. It's right there. You have been made into a fine wine. This is interesting too. So if this is purification water, out of these stone jars, I wonder if people are still dipping this fine wine trying to clean their hands and utensils. Wouldn't that be a waste? I said, wouldn't that be a waste? 
I wonder if somebody in here hasn't been transformed into something entirely different, but you're still just trying to keep utensils clean. It's not working, is it? Because you are something different. You have been made new. Man, that must have been good preaching right there. I'll tell you what. Uh Uh-huh. You have been made something entirely different, but you're still trying to view yourself as purification water, as something that is not worthy, and that's not going to work for you because you are a fantastic wine. Let me tell you right now, you fine as wine. Okay? If, if Christ has been allowed to come into you, he has recreated you, and so that task is not for you anymore. You're made something new. Maybe that will keep you from frustration. Hey, scary to jump into something unknown, something you haven't done before? Yeah, but it's your new nature. It will bring joy to you. Now, we could keep looking and find more gold on the ground. Oh, and, and we could. I, could. I can do that right now. But for time's sake, now I borrow this. I have a friend who is just uh, crazy about metal detecting. And man, what a place to do that in Ranger. There's, we have such a rich history. So much stuff has been done here. That's really cool. Some of the stuff he's found is neat, but he was showing me how to use this. And how cool is this, man, that this can detect something that you can't see with your own eyes? Now, I'm going to teach you how to read the Scripture with this, because as it is with gold, there is more under the ground than there is above the ground. And so, as I go through the Scripture, if I know in advance that there's something there, then... I read it slowly, and then my detector goes off. There must be something right there. Let me look. Let's dig a little bit. Oh, man. Nailed it. Nailed it. Now, how did you do that? This is the part that I don't know. This is where the pastor comes up and speaks, and he talks about something about the Scripture, and I'm like, I never saw that. You will. Let me show you. There's only one brand of metal detector that's going to work for this, okay? It's called Holy Spirit. By that brand only, okay? It's the only thing you need. But as you read through the Scripture, you're going to begin to see some things that catch your eye, and there is a reason for that, okay? Your Bible is what Pastor Dusty is going to call meditation Scriptures, and he's exactly right, They are made for you to meditate on. They are made for you to dig up, to get your hands dirty, okay? Let's look at Let's look at this for just a moment, okay? So what is this new coin that you found? All right. Now, I told you that if it were me, I might would start looking at wine, miracle, his first sign to turn water into wine. Man, is that that's your first big push? Okay, okay, maybe that means you're just being made something new, but why, why wine? And so, as you begin to explore wine in the Bible, you see that often wine is a symbol of God's people, the gift of God to the world. There's supposed to be a kingdom of priests. And so Jesus is going to turn what is unclean not only into something acceptable. He could have just slapped a Dasani label on it and be like, clean water. Why wine? There's other things that are acceptable to drink than wine. See, he has not only made it into something that can bring joy, clean, Gentiles, into what is God's 
for humanity. His people, chosen people. Jesus is showing through his first sign that I am taking unclean people and I am making them my gift to the world. This is your grafting in as God's people. This is how you are God's people without being a Jew. See, the original intent for the Jews, go back through your first five books. It's all there. In fact, every single thing in the Bible will point back to the first five books. I would put $1,000 and every single thing points back to Genesis alone. But every single thing is going to point back to those first five books. And the Jews were called out to be a kingdom of priests. What does that mean? They're supposed to minister to the rest of the world. Yet, they blew it many times, just like we do. And so what ended up happening was uh, one tribe, Levi, ended up being a priest to the other 11. Came that this would be re-upped, renewed, and then the Messiah would come and he would put together a kingdom of priests. And that's where you come in. You have been turned into wine. You are God's gift to the world. You bring joy to people who are blue. Come on. This is why he turned water into wine. Do you understand? It's symbolic of something. So you read this story and you're like, why wine? And then as you begin to study, you understand why wine. I tell you what stands out to me when I read this. And I'm not, it's, it, it take two, there are two things that just really hit me in the face when I read this. If you see something unusual, your detector's going off. It's there for a reason. If you see something in a number, a pattern of numbers, if you see this happen three times, that means something. If you see something took 40 years, that means something. If you see something happen seven times, that means something. God repeats those very often to set off your detector, okay? You're finding gold right there. You need to look and see why it's there. And there's a couple things that really, really, really stand out. One is when Jesus says to his mother, woman, what does this have to do with me? Woo! His mama wasn't from Texas, was she? See, we're projecting our American society on these. If you uh, re really in great research of this, he was giving her a, a sign of respect uh, when he said this. It just, the way it translates into English and then taken into our Texas culture, we're like, uh uh, he did not know. That's not at all what he was doing. I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go into why we can say that. But another thing, there were six stone water jars, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Have you ever seen one of those plastic five-gallon things that you take to work, you know, and you drink water from that all day? 20 or 30 gallons of wine. Dude, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot. You're looking, at, you're looking at well over 100 gallons of wine that have been brought to this party. Woo! But stone? I've seen some things made out of stone before, but typically just like arrowheads, or maybe the little thing that they used to mash corn in, you know, you find those as relics. A stone water jar? That's got to be hard to come by. And how, many, how many stones can you hollow out without breaking it to shreds and make a 20 or 30 gallon jug, much less six of them? Why not clay? Isn't that far more practical? Did this jump out to you? Probably not because you're reading it so quickly. 30 gallon stone water jars. Do you know that means something? Now, you're going to say, Pastor, I wouldn't get this. And that's okay. There is gold on the ground for you to get. But as you read your Bible, you will be able to reference these things over and over and over. See, Everyone is waiting for a Messiah to come. 
And in Deuteronomy chapter 18, they're not just waiting for any Messiah. It says that they're waiting for one like Moses. Look all through the New Testament, and it will say one like Moses has come. Well, what makes Jesus like Moses? Oh, dude, we can geek out on that way longer than what we have time for today. But I'm going to tell you one thing. Moses is taken to the people of Israel back in his day when they were enslaved in Egypt. Many of you know this story. If you've never read the Bible, you know this story. And so he brought them out through, through the, the Lord's help and, and brought them through the Red Sea. And they came through the Red Sea and they went to, to this mountain and... When they were at this mountain, the people began to grumble, and they were like, and this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible, because this is so me. They're like, we miss it back in Egypt. We're thirsty. We're hungry. We're walking all day. At least in Egypt, we had onions. It's just so funny to me that that's what they missed. It's like, dude, when you want to complain, you can just, you can find anything, can't you? Imagine being like, whoo, what I wouldn't give for an onion. (laughs) But you are hungry. But they were desperate. And so God tells Moses, Moses, take your staff and strike this rock and water will come out. And Moses, and I'm totally paraphrasing for you guys, Moses is going to gather everybody up together and be like, hey, the Lord's heard your complaints. And you need to shut your mouth because he's going to take care of you. Wham! And he hits this rock with his staff, and it splits open, and water pours out, and all the people are able to drink. They drank out of a stone. Six stone water jars. A prophet like Moses. Jesus is going to do everything Moses does only better. Moses strikes the rock, and out of the rock comes water to quench the thirst of the nation. Jesus is our rock, and he was struck on a cross. And out of striking that rock, water comes out to quench the nation. Now, let me give you to this just in case you're a nerd. That's not the only time that Moses strikes a rock. He is going to strike a rock the second time, and God is going to be so mad at him for it that he will not get to enter into the promised land. That seems a little heavy-handed, doesn't it? God is like, nope, you're done. You're going to die here. You'll never cross the Jordan River. I'm bringing somebody else because you struck this rock. God said, speak to this rock and water will come out. And he did not have the faith to do it, so instead he strikes the rock. And we know that that rock represents Jesus. And the Bible says that Christ only needed to be crucified once because he was perfect. And out of one crucifixion, The perfect sacrifice pays for all sin for all time. And so now, because you sin again, you no longer need to crucify Christ. Instead, you need to speak to the rock, baby. And water comes out to heal the nations. That's why God was so mad at Moses, because he was like, you ruined it. I was doing something here. So why stone water jars? Because he's going to feed everybody there. He's going to quench everybody there. Because he is the rock that was struck, and he is enough for everyone. That's why you're pumping 120, 150 gallons of wine into this party to show that I have enough for everyone. And not only will I quench your thirst, I will make you something new.
Moses could. He's going to do everything Joshua could. He's going to do everything that David going to be him taking what happened here and doing it better. Last week we talked about the temptation in the desert. He took everything that Adam and Eve couldn't do. wonders aren't willy-nilly. He's not walking around going, what could I do to impress everybody today? Hey, you guys, I've been working on this. Watch this. I'm going to walk on water. No, it means something. So, metal detector goes off. Why? Because I've read Deuteronomy 18.15. Deuteronomy 18.15 says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among your brothers, you must listen to him. So I read this, and, and my detector goes off. Why does this make him a prophet like Moses? Because that's what they're looking for. And I see stone water jars. We can keep going through this passage. Worship team, go ahead and come up. We can keep going through this passage. And I'm telling you, if you, I, there, there's more here, there's more here. I have to dig through just a little bit, man. If I look through, there are coins everywhere. Look at that. More, more. You will read through this passage for the rest of your life, and you will never get all the gold out of it. It will mean something new every time. That doesn't mean that the gold you got last time wasn't valuable. But here's the thing, and this is what makes it so cool. The Holy Spirit is going to beep on the one that you need right then. As every gold nugget's not for the same purpose and it doesn't, doesn't bring the same value to a situation. He knows what you need when you need it. And that is something that YouTube can't do. That is something that no counselor in the world. No, and I'm, just, no, I'm not saying we don't need any of those things. We need all of those things. We need mentors. We need counselors. We need to come to church. We need to hear messages like this. But he has something so tailor-made for you. So, it's like a bucket full of keys. And when he hands you one, that's the only one, man. And the Lord has so much for you. So as you read through your scripture, if this is your first time through, you can get it. I do this with children. I'm not, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic at, at any level right now. I do this with children. We'll read a passage and just go, all right, tell me, what is he saying right here? They can get it. They can get gold off of the ground. You guys can too. God has so much to speak to you. So I wanted to talk to you really about about this sign. So let me just finish with this. And I decided, let's turn this into a Bible study and just kind of learn how to read this. Now, as we're walking through the Gospels, Jesus is going to begin to do signs. Now, the difference between a sign and a miracle, a sign, I mean, think about it. What does a sign do? It points a direction for you. It shows you, it, it gives you a warning. It labels something for you. So when Jesus is doing this, the Bible says in verse um, 11, Jesus did this, the first of his signs. Sign for what? A sign that he's the Messiah. Okay? So why was this her, his first sign? Well, we just talked about that. I don't need to get, go back over that. But he will do seven of these signs. The last will be raising Lazarus from the dead. But every one of them is taking something that one of the characters in the Old Testament who was supposed to be able to save the people failed to do, and he will do it better. And it meant something. Every part of it meant something to the Jewish people. All of the prophecy that he is going to fulfill, all of the things that he do that are miraculously done that a human cannot do will validate that he is the Messiah. Remember as you're reading through the scripture, this is written for you, but it is not written to you, okay? This is ancient Jewish, okay, let me say it this way. This is ancient Middle Eastern literature. 
So read it slow. Get the gold out of it. God has something for you. When you see words repeated, when you see these numbers that you've seen before, you see something that just seems out of place, let your metal detector go off and just find out why it's there. And God has so much revelation for you. And if you do that and it becomes illegal for us to meet tomorrow, it'll be fine because you will not need me. The Lord wants to speak to you personally. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us. I pray that you would teach, rebuke, correct, train us in righteousness. Show us what you would have us do. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for uh, for not only making us something new, but God, making us into something great. When we were unclean and unworthy, God, you were so good to us. We praise you. Forgive us our sins. It will be done in Jesus' name. The worship team is going to play, and uh, people are going to come up with their baskets, so that's uh, part of the way we worship is with tithe and offering. But also, if you have questions, you have something that you're going through, you have something you would like the church to pray with you about, put it on that connection card, drop it in that basket. But better yet, uh, prayer team, if you'd go ahead and come up. We have a prayer team. They'll be here at the front, and we would love to pray with you today in person. And, of course, all those things are kept uh, confidential. So please come see us for that. Other than that, stand and worship with us.